welcome again. My name's Christine. I'm coming to you today from the Rota Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. I'm just gonna take my mask off. Good. A little more comfortable than last time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today, we're again, this session is about spring, and I'm doing spring flowers every week. And I brought in some daffodil paintings, as you can see. So we'll be going through some drawing techniques and preparing us to get familiar with the flower shape. Um, so we're a little more comfortable in drawing it as well as painting it. Um, again, as you can see, there's a lot of different styles. There's some looser paintings. I've taken the main flower head and isolated it, uh, presenting it almost as a portrait of the daffodil flower versus a cluster of them growing in the garden with some horizontal and vertical formats that you can see up here. Um, and I have some different backgrounds. And of course, you can also just paint these or draw these as a vignette with no background, um, where you know, your images aren't even peeking out to the sides, but we're just presenting a nice study of the different gestational uh, stages of this flower growing from, you know, its bulb stage to its, its first bud and the blooming of the flower. All right, I always like to just tell a couple little interesting facts about the flowers. I enjoy painting, and I really enjoy painting these. They're very fancy, they're very bright. Um, these are silks right now because they're just bigger and larger for you to see. Right now in the marketplace, they're selling small uh, bundles that are, most of them are from Ireland, believe it or not, they're shipped over dry, um, but they come without leaves. So again, these have some leaves you know, in the study, and they have some of the calyx brown wrappers that you see on the bottom of the flowers. You may hear some noises during our taping today, so there's some guys working on the roof, thank God, they're doing a great job fixing all of our rain problems, so you'll be happy to know that. Um, the tiles are back up in our, <laughs> in our classroom ceilings. And I also want to welcome Zana and Andrea that are here out of sight to you, but these are the gals that have been filming all of your teachers for you during this session. Um, all right, so uh, just a little history on, on these bulbs, which are quite beautiful. Um, they really have grown in Europe. They're, uh, they're popular in Europe, and uh, they were growing in North Africa years ago, and I mean years ago that they have been recorded in the botanical um, archives in Greece going back to 300 BC. That's before Christ. Um, this wonderful botanist, and he's a philosopher from Greece, um, Theophastus, has a nine volume book on the existing plants at that time. And he had quite a, a large um, study of just the Narcissus. So again, the Narcissus name, which daffodils comes under, is like the genus or family of this particular looking flower. And there's many sizes and different variations of color uh, and different sizes of bulbs and different sizes of flower heads from uh, the Narcissus gen genus. Um, yeah, an interesting story, how did they, so daffodils are like a common name given to like the most popular or the larger um, varieties of, of this flower. So we're used to, here in the United States and North America, <clears throat> are these larger varieties where, oh, the flowers are a good three inches high and in diameter, and the height of these in the garden can usually go from 12 to 16 inches tall. Um, the bulbs that they grow from, and here's just a little study of how they grow from their bulbs. So this is shrunken down, it's smaller in size, not life size. But the actual bulbs are probably the size of an, a large chestnut, and they actually look like a chestnut. And from them, they come up every year. They also propagate. Um, usually you'll have more flowers than you had the, the year before. That Thank God that, that that bed was cleaned out and taken care of. And you don't want to cut your flowers down too soon. They say to wait six weeks at least after your blooms are gone to, to kind of preserve <clears throat> the food going back into the bulb for next year's crop. Um, so just a little story about how they got their name, and how we, how we, how this name is carried down through the centuries um, of Nar Narcissus. So they say in Greek mythology, there was a man, a Greek man called Narcissus, and he had an admirer, it was a little nymph, and her name was Echo. Echo was in love with Narcissus. He did not like her, he pushed her away. He drove her away and just told him, leave me alone. Well, poor, the poor nymph went on with her life very lonely, 
and they just said she was an echo of herself. They are aware as the name for her, for herself. Um, the god of revenge, Nemesis, heard of this story. He went to find Narcissus, and he lured him to a pond, upon which Narcissus bent over the pond and saw his reflection, and he was always quite enamored and taken by himself. He was very handsome. And needless to say, he leans a little too far, he falls in and he drowns. And they say that Nemesis, again, the revenge god, um, watched over this whole episode and named the flower Narciss, Narciss, Narcissus after him. So uh, just, you know, just taking you back to the, to the name of this flower. So again, people always ask me, or you'll see gardeners, being asked questions, well, what's the difference between a daffodil and a narcissus? They're both in the same family. There's just different varieties. In fact, there's 26,000 varieties that have been hybrid over the last two centuries. <clears throat> and um, in within 56 genus families of this narcissus. So there's so many different uh, pretty varieties. And I may hold up a few photographs of a few. Um, so there's different varieties that are, some are yellow, some are white and yellow. Um, you know, this one, the jonquilla, jean 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 is usually white outer petals, and the, and the daffodil flower, the most simple of this flower, has six white outer petals that are ovate or pointed petals, and they're kind of flat, and they're circular around this protruding cup shape, which is the center of the flower called the corona. And again, it can come in varieties of a light pale yellow versus a deep, rich, like orangey, cadmium yellow orange in the interior. Um, some of them have like a red outline, like you'll see here with the jonquilla, um, where there is actually like a dark green going into brown in the center, into yellow, and this like hot orange or like a cat like cadmium red outer rim. And, uh, and then there's, there's some fancier ones. Um, similar to the fancier tulips that come with this, these are actually beautiful daffodils or for our jonquils that have multiple petals that you can see here, almost in a light peach color. And again, some of them do come in like a peachy pink uh, versus light lemon yellows, uh, white outer petals with lemon uh, center uh, cups coming out uh, versus these deep hot, uh, deeper cadmium yellow ochre uh, colors. and. Let's talk about the leaves. So again, uh, the leaves on this flower, what's interesting is that this flower grows on a stem and it's a leafless stem. So the stem is like a tube, like a straw, soda straw shape, but it's leafless. The, the leaves all protrude and grow out of the bulb. And they, they tend to bend, and I'm gonna go back to this drawing here. So the leaves, you can see, all these flowers are on a thin stem which are leafless. All the leaves attached to the same bulb emanate from, from that bulb, okay? And then each bulb may be more prolific than the one next to it. So when you see a bunch of healthy daffodils growing, you'll have a, sometimes you'll have a real nice thick bunch like this. And yesterday was a very windy day, and I saw clusters of these just bending over. So this flower, it's very delicate and light, and the leaves, as well as the flower head on its thin stem, is very bendable and really takes that movement. So you may find some on a sunny, dry day like this. There's no wind outside today. They may be more upright and still. You won't get this kind of bending action like you see here or in this composition over here um, or this composition over here. So again, um, not to say that you, when, once, you, once you get familiar with the flower head, now it's a matter of you drawing it from different angles or perspectives. I have this paper cup just to talk about that. So again, as they grow, sometimes if the wind is quite prolific, they all, all the cups and flower heads may all turn this way, away from the wind. But on a nice sunny day, they may come back and each, each daffodil may have, a, it's grown at a certain angle. So the flower heads are not facing each other or facing all in the same direction. Like here we see to these two bottom ones, this one's facing down to the left. This one's facing down to the right. This one's also facing down to the right, and this one's also to the right. So again, you'll have, there's, there's a piece of one up here. There's a piece of one over here. So in painting this, um, I have a nice cluster of four and a piece of one five, and 
a nice asymmetrical composition. So they're kind of making this V shape, a split V shape. And once you get that, that's your main focal point, or, or the flower heads. Um, all of this you can just add in later. It's nice to have show. Can you send please pick up the call from Thank you. You're welcome. So now we have this bendable stem here so that you, that's visible, whereas you can't see the back side of how these flowers are attached to their stem. Um, this little wrapper that you see exposed is quite nice. It's like an onion skin, and it's called a calyx. Um, that's kind of like a common flower sepals where um, there's something attached to the, to the stem where the, the bud grows from. So this wrapper is, will always be there uh, until the flower wilts, but that's something interesting if you get a shot or you draw it into your composition. Not necessary at all times. Here I'm showing one, and meanwhile these flower heads are so large, they're acting outer petals that are the pointed ones are just hiding that, that calyx that's, that's on the back side. So I just want to point out how you can like overdo it. I mean, I'm guilty of this too, we all are. Sometimes we just overdo it. We start drawing and drawing, and then we've drawn too much. Sometimes it's nicer to pull back and leave the background uh, a little more abstract, like this one here, where you don't have to give that much information, but we're suggesting some dark leaves. Um, these may be some dried up leaves from plants that are from, from behind. I brought a little bit of the purple color, and you'll see the purple color here. Um, I just want to mention, I may throw a little purple um, out of focus in my background. I'm just I'm doing just a bed, some straight flowers. They're all kind of tilting which way. Um, here I threw in some grape hyacinths, which I may do in my demo, but I'm not going to give them too much attention as I did here. I gave quite a bit of detail information on them, whereas you don't have to. And some, you can see here, I just have some solid painted uh, violet colors coming through with no detail where these are, let's say, in the plane of these flowers all being in focus, so I went in and gave some detail. Um, we can tell from the lighting in here, the light's coming from the upper right, so these conal shades of the grape hyacinth are a little lighter in value and a little cooler in color on the right side, and as they turn to the right, they're getting much darker, so we're getting a little three-dimensionality on the grape hyacinths, which are all interrupted because they're growing within the bed of daffodils, they're interrupted by see, these tall leaves that are growing up and through and hiding some of the grape pies. So, so they're not the dominant flower here, your, your jonquils are. Um, okay, so here we have some open space, some interesting negative shapes. Um, here we have a whole flower that's off-center again. I always talk about how you have your main flower a little off-center, not in the very center. Um, here, this is set here. I have it centered, but it's attached to this shape. So again, I always remind you, and I'll talk about this again on the board. Divide your composition into four quadrants, and you want to have different positive and negative shapes in each of the four corners. Um, so here you can see how I'm treating the background with kind of like just some muddy, wet into wet, out of focus information that just has neutral garden colors like earth colors and of keeping the colors within this very analogous, meaning they're all close to each other. They're neighbors of each other on the color wheel. Um, this was actually done on a, on a, it wasn't watercolor paper, it was on drawing paper, so it has a different look where the paint didn't sink in to the watercolor paper. Uh, and you'll find that in your, your painting experience with watercolors that certain services or different manufacturers make different absorbencies in the watercolor. This, and I use cold press all the time. And, and you'll, you'll find that out. You know, Fabriano is a, is a wonderful um, watercolor paper. It goes back 500 years to the town of Fabriano, Italy. Um, very absorbent, almost like paper towels. You'll get very soft edges. It'll be tough to get hard edges painting in Fabriano. Um, I like that. I like Windsor Newton uh, paper. Um, I've been using some of this as just cans on out of pads during the pandemic. So. I've been working smaller, so even in my lap, so I'm not working on some large 30 inch sheets of you know, good watercolor paper to pull these off. And again, these are studies of flowers, so you don't want to get that crazy and making them too large. Um, here's a nice, again, um, composition with there's three large studies where they're all overlapping each other. This one's at, overlapping this flower, this one's overlapping that flower. Nice diagonal strong movement coming here. And again, I have this quadrant is different than this quadrant where I have some deep darks. And these are dark leaf shapes, but yet there's some open holes that take you way back. 
uh, like you see here, there's some light coming through. So my flowers here are all mid values, whereas here they're definitely light, the lighter values, lighter values, lighter values. Um, here they have a lot of bit of color, but I've left some unpainted white highlights on those outer petals and on the ridges of that beautiful ruffled center cup or corona. Um, I don't have many whites on the tips of the greens, but again, I did feed in, I, I think I gave a wash of some yellows first and then some lighter greens, and then I went into the negative spaces to get rich darks with some purples. You could use permanent magenta. I, could, I can recognize the colors permanent magenta, some cobalt blue. I have seen male ochre and uh, burnt sienna in here. And again, if you just get darker and heavier on the two darker, the blues and the purples, you can get a really nice rich dark value. Then I, I gave a back row of some very dark recessed tips of daffodil leaves just to kind of separate the, the foreground massive shape, which is coming up four fifths of the composition of your flower heads and leaves. And then this is just kind of separating and giving a nice recessed dark. So again, this is a heavier, heavier color, more um, dramatic colors and more dramatic value in lighting here versus something like this, which is lighter and airier. And again, I, I, I talk about how your mood today, really um, the, your drawing style of today and your painting style and the colors you choose and your lighting system has a lot to do with just your energy that you have today. And not to worry again about what's right or what's wrong, just enjoy painting the flower. And in painting flowers, again, I always beat it into you all you need to do is capture the essence of this flower. You want it to be recognizable. And again, have some fun playing with different studies. And again, you can get even more abstract. These are, these are loose, some of them are tighter, but you can get a little more abstract. I'm going to take a sip of water here. So I'm talking about simpler studies. Um, I usually do something like this as a warm up. I may paint this. I have a more formal drawing that's already prepared to paint later. But I just sketched this just before we started taping. And just a real loose, I'm not doing a great job in defining these, not, not a lot of detail, but I am getting the main shape down there. But it, you can do a nice loose warm up watercolor sketch with a loose sketch like this. Or this was done with a flare pen uh, by Papermate, and they're water soluble. And I I, you can see when I came back with a little bit of water, when you do multiple strokes, it'll build up some value with the black, which bleeds into almost like a purplish black ink wash here. And this was a touch of some a yellow watercolor pen that I just dropped a little bit in. But I'm just playing around with composition. And I'm, I'm using a lot of the um, energy of your negative space. Your negative space is everything that's around all your positive drawing, leaves, stems, and flower heads. So there's a nice, interesting flow and interesting negative shapes that are helping to make these really dance and kind of move in the wind. So these sketches like this kind of really help you in a warm-up before you sit down to do um, you know, a long one to two hour watercolor study. And I encourage you to do them. Put those back here. Okay, so then here's another study that I did before I start drawing on here. Um, this was done with a permanent black inking pen so it wouldn't bleed. And it's a study, I started with this main flower, I dropped down its stem and I did a few cross leaves and then I moved on to this one, I moved down to this one and then I threw in, this was the last little budding small shape that I threw in behind here, but I worked them all in and I'm looking to create a beautiful rhythm in between my leaves and my stems and my negative spaces. So there's a nice energy of flowing you know, not only within, but around uh, the four flowers. And you're getting a feeling of how they grow. I'm showing you those, that wrapped calyx, that, that kind of um, yellow ochre onion skin that's um, at the top of the stem and wraps around the bud as it grows and blooms and blossoms. And then we have varieties of um, growth and also varieties of views. So this one's looking like straight at us with a little tilt down of the head versus these two are looking to the right, one is looking down and this one's tilting to the left way down. So we're getting a whole different perspective and that's a lot of more foreshortening for you to be a little observant of and to pull off and still making the flower look correct drawing wise, 
but at least we're getting a little variety and adds a little more interest uh, in the overall of, of this study. And again, a lot of open space. I just had a cut off at the bottom, so that was permanent marker. And then I came back in with um, watercolor pens. Okay, and I think I gave a little shot of water on them, and I left a couple little open whites. I did vary. I want you to see, and I know if the camera can pick this up, coming coming in farther, is the variation of thick to thin um, width of your line work. So when you want to outline up to pop out a flower. I went back and really pressed down to get a heavier thickness of the outline and I try to always like leave a little open um, a little open spot on the on the outline of the flower so it's not so closed and tight. So we, we're inviting the energy of the, the background area into the flower. And then those little bending, these kind of like shadowing contour lines are very thin. And I put them down with just like the lightest touch of pressure on the paper and with like a little flick of your wrist. So we're showing the bendable or the contours of the petals. And some of the, some one petal may have a, con, a contoured area that's concave and convex all in one petal. Um, you'll see with the six petals also that they overlap each other. There's three on top and three on the bottom. And I'll get into that when I start drawing over here, but that's just another study. Here's a nice close up of looking right into that flower head as if I'm turning this and it's just looking right at you. So um, it's tilted down just a touch, and it almost has like a nice lacy, you look at the beautiful ruffles that you see, and I just want you to notice how, just within your yellows, um, I usually, you can get by with three yellows on your palette. A cool yellow, that's your lemon yellow, a warm cadmium yellow, that would be this in, this in here, and then the center, I brought in yellow ochre and a little touch of a light orange, so cadmium orange light, or just watered down cadmium orange medium, mixed in with cadmium yellow to get uh, these hotter colors. In the interior here, I've yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and cobalt blue, and the cobalt blue is neutralizing with those, the two warm colors, and give me some interesting grays uh, that are quite nice. And I did use those two colors, two blues, later on in my greenery. Uh, so I do have I, some of the yellows I've also used in my greenery on the stems and leaves here. Or I've taken maybe lemon yellow with a little winter green, which is a very, it's a cold green mixed with a hot yellow green. Um, you could mix your two yellows, your two light yellows, lemon yellow, cadmium yellow, with cerulean and cobalt blue to get interesting green. Uh, you can go heavier with your blues like here get to get these really dark um, shadow leaves that are way behind because as they start crisscrossing in the depth of this flower bed, you're going to have some leaves and some that are in total, in total shadow. Uh, some of those leaves might pop out in some sunlight and they go back in and lift out or come in with a thick, opaque cadmium yellow to, to brighten it a little bit. Um, then again, I have some holes of negative spaces all through here. Here's a little bit of sky color that I brought in. It's, it's a beautiful turquoise color to suggest sky versus just some neutralized, uh, like earthy colors, or some dark grays or neutrals. I don't want to draw too much attention to what's happening behind these dark recessed areas. Um, and here again, this particular flower um, is one with the yellow copper center like these, and white outer petals. Okay, so you can see the six outer petals, and now we're looking full frontal into the inside of that, of that cup. And what's inside, or your usual, we'll have a pistol or stigma, and in your anthers that are uh, growing all around it. And again, some of them are more visible. Usually they're just like a yellow color, but as that cup in the flower tilts away from the sun, it that may take on a different color or look. If these flower heads are tilted down towards the ground, they're gonna pick up some greens off the, the leaves. Uh, if they're tilting up to the sun, they may pick up some blue coming in to the interior of that recessed cup shape. Okay, so let's get into some drawing here. And Again, um, my students are familiar with, you know, like the drawing class preceding the watercolor class. It's a nice warm up to get familiar with your subject. Um, all right, so I'm dealing with dry markers, and the tough part is if I, if I draw in black and I come back to color with yellow, the yellow is just going to bleed and get contaminated and drag the black in and yellow and gray down. Uh, my, my flower colors, so I have to be careful in how, in how I draw it. So I'm going to draw some without coloring at all, so they'd be more visible. So let's talk about the main flower here and um, just the structure of this flower. So we have, uh, we're going to have
five, six, and I'll draw them maybe like kind of facing a little bit to the right. So you're going to have, uh, again, I'm going to mention a, a cup and saucer. So if I draw the cup and saucer in a different color, let's do orange. So let's say we have one facing up and facing down over here. So we'll draw a, a teacup. I just want to get this a little bolder so you can see it. We have a teacup here, and it's sitting in a saucer. So this is going to help you understand um, the structure of the daffodil. So again, we're going to, let's just to get a little more obvious. So we're, this is going to, all of these have ridges. We're going to have six outer petals here. So let's say we start with this one here. This one, we're going to see all of the sides. This is here. And now it's going to have ridges. And the ridges that I draw in, I'm turning and giving a little contoured flick, coming in very light with the pressure on my finger. To cat, this is your first petal. It's the closest one to us. It's going to be the largest. Now we're going to work on the sides going back and around. So we start with this petal. So the two petals next to it, we're going to see less of this. We're going to see them on their side. So we're foreshortening them on their side. So here's the back side of this. Here's the front side. And we're going to see a little bit of that underside of this petal here. And again, I like when I'm drawing here. Again, I, uh, I'm standing up. I have a lot of loose room, I have a lot of energy in my arm. So why not bring some of that energy into your wrist? And the way you hold your tool has a lot to do with um, having a, a little more energy or excitement to your, your line. So again, here's the back side of this pedal, which is going to replicate this on this side. It's coming out here, and we're going to flip it up and show a little bit of its side there. So now, we, there's six petals. This is going to block. This is so big. Again, it's a cup shape like this. So it's sitting up here. It's hiding that back petal. So we're going to be seeing five petals, but basically there's six. So the, what we're going to see here is a little bit of this coming out way over here. It's going to look much smaller than this. And this one's way over here. We see a little bit of its underside there. And we're not seeing the back petal. So um, again, it's, uh, you know, you're going to see everyone. If I had a full class here, and I went around the room, everyone's daffodil and narcissus will look so different from everyone else's because your personality comes out with your drawing stuff. Now we're going to do this ruffled cup called a corona. So um, let's give it like a central ellipse. And I did that little light. So now I'm going to come with that ruffle. This is the front side of that cup. If we think of a cup or a boss. And we can get a little heavier with the thickness of our, our curve. And I'm just going in and out with the ruffle. And that ruffle is going to start to turn. And then when we get to the back side, it's going to get we're going to see less of it, like so. Um, the inside will have some lines coming down because there are ridges in, in this cup. There's also ridges on all of these. So I'm putting a little bit of those lines to remind you as you paint with your brush. Um, your strokes, you'll press down and lift up. You'll press down and lift up to get the contour of, of these side cups going up. Um, so and, and the inside of this is, is, cur is curved in. So this, these lines are just helping you imagine the contour, how this is going down into that space. And of course, from here, you'll probably see a little bit of that central um, pistol and then a little bit of the anther. So just put a little few of those. Um, All right, so if these are growing in the garden, you may not see this. these drop petals will hide probably hide that calyx that's coming down. But let's, if you take a line, direct line off that pistol right here, just drop it down, and this is where your stem will be coming out. So that stem should come up and just flow right up to that center of pistol. Uh, so you got a, a good alignment of its stem and, and the, width of its, the width of its stem right over here. Okay, so let's do, let's do like a smaller one over here. So this is gonna be overlapping this one here. So again, if I, draw this, and let me, let me use the odd color again. We'll do another, let's add this one over here where it's kind of looking down a little more. So we're seeing a little bit of that cup here, and um, we'll have the teacup, the saucer, like so. So this one is to the right of this, it's over left of this guy here. So again, we start to draw this, where this is kind of coming out, and we'll do a little bit of a, if I do a little bit of a, Center like here. We're not seeing too much of that because that, that, the back side is kind of flipped under. We might see a little bit of that pistol in the anthers right here. 
And since this is pitched out, um, this is overlapping this. So let's come in, we'll have this one petal that's kind of coming out of it and it's going to overlap the next one. Uh, we're, not, we're not seeing what's happening there, but we're going to have a petal here that's just tucked under there. And then again, we're going to have the side petal over here and another petal over there. We're missing that one over there. So again, let's follow the, um, the stem where it's, it basically comes up and then it pivots and turns down. So the stem of this flower is coming down about over there. And then if you just bring in some leaves, the leaves, again, these are all emanating from a bulb, which is in the ground, or maybe if it's in a pot, some of these are grown in pots, you may see a, it's down a little bit. These stems would be much longer than that growing in the garden, so I'm just bringing this down. And then now we just start to introduce some nice bending leaves. So I'm drawing both sides of the leaves, and you just start breaking up the space uh, you start crisscrossing, let's bring another one in over here, and maybe we'll bring one from all the way from over here, and it's going to just bend through these. So it's creating some nice crisscrossing diagonals, and um, it's helping to balance. These two are having a nice diagonal kind of coming down this way. So I have the wealth of these kind of counterbalancing those. Uh, we definitely would need some more upright, I'd say, stems or some more flower heads through here to help counterbalance this whole movement. I don't want your, you don't want your drawing kind of leaning out of the picture plane. So you start intuitively drawing counterbalancing diagonals to make these hold up. So if this is another flower, it could come way up here and we maybe we'll just see the tip. I'll just draw this right here without doing the teacup. This may be up here and we'll see some petals over there. So we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, let's bring in again some more leaves that are helping to balance with what we just put in there. So there's just a nice little grouping there. And again, this is your most dominant uh, flower. So that's going to be your focal point. And the others are less important because if they're being overlapped and they're going back in space. But it's just some, you know, a little demonstration of showing you, you know, how to start a sketch. And, and to think, uh, again, we, we think as we draw. And um, you, you just intuitively start to counterbalance the movements down here. I would say always avoid a true crisscross. Some, sometimes you say Mark start crisscrossing, but it's too much of an X. So try to have these, and they're all these are also very bendable. So I'm adding a little more movement. So again, now it's a matter of do you want to go with a white background? If you're going to go with a white background, then get stronger, more vibrant, deeper saturation of colors on your flowers and your leaves and your stems against that white background. If you're not, and you're going to go in with some deep negative, um, a, a full background, um, depends on how dark you get. Uh, these are just true unpainted whites of the page. So I'm not, we're not using any white, Chinese white, gouache. I'm just leaving the unpainted whites for those leaves or if you have any highlights. Same here. There's a lot of white. I very, very softly with like a gray, a violet gray, and you see some cerulean blue. And some of the shadow areas, again, all of these white flowers are all leaning down. So they're picking up colors off the ground or from the hyacinths that are growing at their feet. So you wouldn't see true white. The only true white you'd see are in flowers that have a little more um, edges that are, are facing the sun. So again, and depending on the flowers too, they're, they're just different types. Some of these outer petals will also be furled and curled and have some of their backsides will pick up some highlights of the overhanging sun. Okay, so let's get into some color drawing. And so we'll be drawing, we'll be drawing in some, in some colors. So I'm just looking at some of my paintings here. Okay, so, um, so these are just drawing markers. So I, I don't have a variety of yellows like I do in my paints, or you wouldn't a colored pencil set or in your pastel set. Um, so I'm I have like a warm and cool green, and I have two yellows. One is cool, it's kind of a greenish, and the other is just a straight warm lemon yellow. So we'll use that to draw with. So I'm just looking down. So let's just draw. Here's that Kumana, that central cup shape. And I'm giving it a nice little turn here, and we'll do some outer. So here, I'm going to have. These two are overlapping that petal there. This petal you would draw 
It's underneath this one here. And of course, then down here, we're not really seeing um, that, 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 that sixth petal. We may see like a little bit of it, but here, you know, here goes this. Um, this set up a little bit. Let's position another one over here where we're going to have the, this is the sun. was haunted, did you girls? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those are after workers working on the roof, so I apologize. You may hear a little bit of banging now and then. I could handle the ghost better than that. Okay, so here's our corona. Here's our second flower. It's not going to be as important as this. So here's my trumpet or the cup shape hanging out. This is a petal that's foreshortened. So if this is the cup shape here, this petal is basically coming out like this a little bit. We're not seeing it all the way back like that. It's, it's foreshortened. It's coming forward a little bit like that. So I'm um, drawing it that way. So then we have some back puddles that may, again, we're just seeing parts of. So they're not as important as this front petal. So we're just squeezing those in like so. And then let's have one pitch down over here. And we'll have this top petal here. This is going this way, where this is going to go at an angle and have that stem probably coming down. Like so. So I have, these two are kind of facing that way, this one's facing this way. That's a study of three. I like keeping things in odd numbers in a small study. And I'm just going to draw it before I get to the point. Let's put in some of our stems and leaves. So again, we're looking for some lyrical dancing. I, I, at this point, you may not want to even look at a photograph because sometimes your flower beds are really clustered and overwhelming. So we need to weed out. We need to eliminate some shapes in order to have a more a nice rhythmical dance going on. So here we have. We're going to uh, again. If we have the pistol coming out from here, we are just showing the tips of the pistol and the anther. So we follow this line through here, and it's going to bend back here. So this will be our stem. So we'll come in with some green. And that's kind of like, so it's, it's, it's continuing up in there. And so this is coming down to the roots. And then we may block that with some of these nice, thin, slender leaves. So these are kind of upright. They're kind of angled facing in. But let's bring in some, like one that's like tilting in. So this is helping to balance uh, this. We can have one facing out to counterbalance that that leaning movement coming in towards the painting. Um, this is this is this is this uh, calyx here, and and here we have its stem. This is going to be the stem of the seven flower. And let's draw in some some leaves now, so we can make them thicker. This is our stem. This is our stem over here to this guy here. I'm just going multiple repetitive um, lines back and forth. Let's, let's bring in a little leaning, bendable curve over here and maybe another one here to break up all that vertical action. And then we may have one overlapping that. So I'm just going back and giving it a little thickness, just like coloring in between the, the contour drawing line. So we start to get a pattern going on over here. And a rhythm of what's going on in this particular flower bed. Sounds like the steel drum bands from the Caribbean. Right, right. <laughs> Susanna, can you go get us some Mai Tais? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's come back and again. So these are these are light green that I'm filling in. Let's come in with the darker, cooler, uh, darker value green. This is a cooler green now. 
So it'll give us a little more variety. It's not as dark as I want this. Actually, it says green. It's a green, but it's coming out turquoise. Let's try and make it green here. That's turquoise too. So it's a cool green, but it, boy, it just looks. shape, which is kind of nice, and again, it helps the pot. When we get more of the yellow in the flower, um, it's, it's going to help. So I'm feeding these in, in between the spaces so that these are running behind the light green valued leaves that are growing in front of it. So we start to get like a weaving and a thickness and a little bit of three-dimensional depth of field by overlapping shapes. All right, so let's try and use... So I don't have yellow ochre, I only have yellows, I do have some browns, I have some oranges. Let's come in with the orange and work on a little bit of this, this dark center. So notice the, the, the direction of my strokes are taking the contour of the inside of that cup. That Corona cup. And as we color, this is the, the cup shape now, and what I want to do is so we'll have our sun coming from the right. I would leave maybe a quarter of this unpainted white, and then we'd start to come in again with these vertical, repetitive strokes that can start to fill in color. I'm leaving that as a highlight on this cup. I also want to come in here and give a little bit of a ruffled edge here that'll be also white, and then we'll fill in, and these are tight, repetitive strokes, but they're also taking the contour of that outside ruffle. Come in with the brown. Just to use that. So we'll get a little darker. We're dark enough, but we got a little bit darker in that center. And let's bring a little bit of shadow on the cool side. That this is the cup away from the sun. So we're introducing some um, undulating ripples or ridges on the side of the flower. And then we'll come in again. Our sun is coming from the upper right. So as these petals tuck in, I'm buttoning the cup. I'm going to again tight strokes that are suggesting ridges. And I'm going to leave this corner unpainted as if the sun is coming in. Um, over here, the sun will probably just hit that top of that petal over here. So again, I'm my strokes are defining those, those uh, nice ridges and the, the pleats that are in the flower here, but it's helping to, now it's defining that beautiful highlight on the side of that cup. Over here, I'll leave the top of this unpainted and our strokes will come in. These are the pleats that we see growing, uh, growing and within the petal. 
And then down here, this one is really going to be in shadow, so you can you won't have any white highlights on this petal down here that's below and in the shadow of the cup. So I'm trying to just lay it out with your basic local yellow color first. And then we'll come back and I'll do the same on this petal here. So we have a foundation of yellow. But then we're going to come back, let's come back with that brown. And we're going to create shadow. on a cold pressed paper where you're swiping just very gently and letting the, the hairs of your brush just kind of hit the high tooth of the paper. So this is a solid smooth board. What I'm doing is I'm flicking it and just getting like the edge, slight edge of this to, to drop some color down. And we're helping to shadow, to create shadow next to this edge. That's, it's, this is in the shadow of the, the cup that's in the center. And then I'm gonna come around here and I'm, I'm bringing this down as a shadow over there. Let's come back with a little orange. So that orange starts to bleed some of the brown and drag into the yellow ink that, that was put down. I'm just going to reiterate this edge right here, maybe like use my finger just to lift this up a little bit to clean up that edge. So we start to get a nice three-dimensional look here. Let's go back to that first light brown. This is a light brown marker. I want to get some more pronounced shadows there. It's not working. Let's come back with some orange. So we're going to use the orange. I probably would use yellow ochre. So we're going to introduce, a, these are tucked in underneath that cup. So there's a little bit of shading that's going to help to make these little three dimensional as they come away from behind that center cup. So we're getting a nice look, okay, of the, really the, the actual form, the three dimensional structure of the daffodil now mm. and how you applied your strokes in drawing is the same principle of how you're going to apply your brush strokes in your painting, whether you're painting in acrylics or oils or watercolors. Um, the difference with watercolor is that you can put less paint down near there's those shadowed edges here at the petals and then extend them with some clean water going out to a dry, unpainted, highlighted tip and controlling that. If you were painting in oils, opaque oils or acrylic, you'd be using white. Uh, to add a tint to it, get lighter, and then lift the white and just get darker near those shadowed edges. I'm going to come back with a little more darks. Maybe over here, under here. Okay, so we're getting a little more three dimensional work in here. Um, and I wish I had some. These pens are. are they have their limitations, I must say. Okay, let's move on to another. Which color did I draw brown? Okay. All right, so we're going to come over here. So again, um, I would make, if that's your more dominant flower, I would do that first, because you're going to have more focus and attention to get that one f finished. And once you do, you're going to put, put your less amount of energy left into your less important flowers, okay? I always work on the more dominant flowers that are more or less in your focal area. Um, so same principle here. This one's looking a little more to the side. We're seeing less inside the cup. So let's just start putting in some radius. Again, our sun's coming to the right, so I would leave a good half inch of an unpainted highlight on the top of this cup. So we're working around this petal here. And again, my lines are all coming in into ridges. This is coming in over here, I'll, I'll just give this a little foundation color. Um, this one's kind of facing down in a way. I think maybe this the top of this would have some white. So I'm coloring the inside of that. This petal's turning around. If the sun's coming here, maybe the upper third, I would leave white, totally white. So this is the bottom of that petal, so I'm leaving a lot of white. But because I came in and colored those two back petals, it helped to set up the highlight of the, you know, the positive highlighted shapes of this petal and the cup here. Okay, so again, uh, those, that yellow I applied 
uh, was, was really coming down in high downward strokes on me. So let's come and put these in a little more darkness. Let's apply an orange first. I want to get a little more shadowing on the cool side of the shadowed side of the cup. And then in here, this is going to be darker on the inside of the cup. So a little tiny stroke suggesting that. Here. Okay, so these petals are farther back and they could just be darker in value and you know different color. Sometimes I add a little cerulean blue to my orange or my yellow ochre to give me more of a shadow color um, on the cool shadowed side. So um, it has something to do with these dry markers. So I'm going to do that. Okay, so here we have a little more shadow close where the petals, or where we're just seeing for the first time, where the petals are overlapping each other. And then this is that wrapper, the calyx, that's on that visible um, wrapper that's attaching the flower to the stem. Okay, so here, we'll, let's color that in over here. So again, it's kind of like an onion skin. It just wraps and twists around. So again, as I drew it, I'm showing the kind of twisting of that. Let's come back and get some brown. Okay, so again, lightly, I've got to come in and just sh shade a little bit of that, um, defining this ruffled edge here. I'm just going to darken the interior of that. I may do a little more of the brown just here, there. We get a little bit of brown again on that, that calyx or the wrapper that's attached to the flower. And then these, these are petals that are farther back. Oh, dry markers that under this is a third passage of color, so it's it's lifting up when I put down. Let's try a little more orange. And this orange is going to pick up some of that brown. So maybe we're going to get a little more value. Two sets of uh, watercolor pens that are really great to help you do a warm up before you jump into painting. And and they, if you do them on a watercolor pad or, or paper, um, you just come back with a little bit of water and the colors, the inks just bleed and spread. So you don't have to put as much ink down as you think as I'm doing here with this. As these are dry erase markers. Um, but those are quite fun. Also a great warm up exercise for you to get familiar with your subject. So here, here my yellow picked up a little bit of the green and blue, and it looks nice, where I'm getting some a cooler and a darker value on the left side of this flower over here. So I'll pick up some of the green in this stem over here and kind of carry it through. And then we have this elongated cup. I'm saving a highlight on that. So this one's tilting down. Let's come back with a little orange. Back with that orange to 
the orange ink picks up some of the brown. Inside, inside that daffodil. So, all right, so you get the idea. And um, what I want to do now is I'm going to move around to the back and get a little comfortable and uh, set up to start painting, which won't take long. Just okay, so I just moved back here to get myself a little more comfortable. I have my palette to my right. Um, again, if you're right-handed, you're a right-handed artist, keep your water to the right of your palette and keep your paints to the right also. So we're bringing, um, you know, you don't want to have your water over here and be right-handed and go back and forth over your painting, dripping water back and forth. So my water pail's out of sight. I always use like a kitchen sponge to get excess water off, some dry paper towels, kitchen towel handy, and I pull out, oh, maybe like 10 brushes that I may use, I may not use all of these. Um, do this for yourself. I usually will paint, or maybe on the edge of my good paper. Um, I'll just put out some colors that I think I'm going to use. Um, I have sap green, I have cobalt and cerulean ultramarine, and if you mix them with your yellows, and I'll be using probably four yellows, Naples yellow, lemon yellow, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, and burnt sienna, and probably an orange. Um, if I introduce anything other than this, um, I'll call it out to you. But in the meantime, I just want you to know which I will be using the new shape as I paint. I mentioned what I've just mixed. So this is a small painting, but I have um, a little bed of flowers. And here's a, a tracing paper laid over where I, you know, I would have started with a composition like this. You can either transfer a pounce in a drawing onto your good paper, or else if you're confident enough and you've done, done enough of these flowers, um, go immediately and then sketch on your good paper. When you're sketching on a good paper, don't use a sketching paper that has a soft, thick lead like this. This is going to lay down a lot of the lead that's going to bleed into your paints. Use a hard number two pencil and with a very light line, uh, draw in your, your pre-sketch. So I just want to show you that, again, I always talk about create your perimeter. Create your four quadrants, okay? So here I have this one's, this, this, this flower is sitting here, but it's attached, it's overlapping this one and this one. So I have a nice diagonal, a curved diagonal movement, kind of going from the upper right quadrant down to lower left quadrant. Over here I have a, um, another flower that's looking off, it's foreshortened, and looking off to the right. It's bleeding out to the right. So we're seeing maybe four-fifths of that flower, but it's creating an interesting negative space between this flower and this, and this upper right quadrant. I have a little bud. Um, by itself up here. So it's showing you again some stages, some variety of sizes of the flower as it grows. So I have it up high and it's by itself giving a lot of negative energy around it. And it's up there and again it's above this kind of uh, collective curve of uh, three ellipses of flowers kind of bleeding off. So again, I've got part of the flower off there. These three went off to here so it's, it's like Three, four, five, six, whatever. So it's like five and a half flowers there. And then I just kind of worked out a rhythm of crisscrossing and counterbalancing some leaves and stems in my bottom, leaving some open negative spaces. If you were going to paint this and have an unpainted background, go pretty heavy and strong on your first shot of color. Um, so you want to get the values right and the colors right on your first shot. If you're going to be painting a background and uh, let's say getting a, a more a darker negative so here's, here's your light flowers. The background is all mid-values to darks. So um, uh, then, then you can probably go lighter in your values on the flowers and on your leaves, knowing you're going to paint in a rich, dark, negative shape back there. And depending on time, I'll, I'll know which way I'm going to fly. So let me take this off, just tape at the top. I don't need this anymore. <clears throat> I may put a shot of some blue violets and I haven't pre-sketched any of these, of these grape hyacinths. Um, that may be some interesting um, background negative color just to cause a little pop in those complements going on with the blue violets against the brilliant yellows. Uh, so I usually start with the flowers first because my water's clean, my paints are clean. And what I'm gonna try to do since I have limited time here is let's just go in with the general local color and try to put a little bit of color on all of these flowers all at one time. So, 
Um, and in, in my head, again, remember when I was at the drawing board there, I'm going to, oh, let's have our, I, my son to my upper left over here. I just noticed I switched to this side. Okay. So I'm going to leave highlights to the upper left. So as I do that, this is a little mix of maples yellow with a little cad yellow. And let's come up here. Actually, I actually touched a little bit of Aurelian yellow, which I had on the side, which is, is a more translucent yellow. So again, I'm leaving some unpainted whites at the top edges of those. I can always feed this color up. So we're getting, again, a local color down. This is really Aurelian that I'm... I'm putting down now. I left a little bit of white up at the top. Let's come back. And this is a large number 14 sable brush that I'm working with. So we're putting down, and by the time I get to here, when I come back to come in with my darks, my darker values on the daffodils, this will start to dry. We'll put a little bit on the edge of this, but I'll leave a highlight on there if I do come in with a painted dark background. Okay, now that puts down this, I just want you to see the full body of this brush. That's a lot of hair, so it's gonna hold a lot of water. Now that I'm coming back into a wet, uh, freshly with one, one, one glaze, one passage of that oriel and yellow down, I want a brush that's not gonna put down as much water. This is a number 10 lettering brush, and it has maybe a third of the hairs that that one has here. And these, these are synthetic. They don't hold as much water as the, the natural animal hairs. I'm going to come back in with a little cadmium yellow mixed with a touch of yellow ochre and we'll get a nice kind of a canary a color to this. So I'm going to feed this in, this is into that center of that cup, and I'm going to feed it since our sun's coming from the upper left, I drew my little sun shape over there. I'm coming in with a darker yellow on the back, these are the under pet petals that are in the shadow of that large cup that's raised. So that was cadmium yellow with a little touch of yellow ochre. I'm feeding those in here, and you can see I'm painting pretty quickly, and again, the quicker you paint, the looser your painting is, is going to be, um, and I'm doing this for time's sake. And I have a lot of information on my drawing. I may not even get to come back in and actually use some of that, but I may come out and lift out some highlights. So this is wet, but it's starting to dry. It's, it's not like very runny. So I'm giving a nice deep solid color on the interior. There with the highlight on the top. And maybe at the bottom of this little bud over here we get a little darker. And then this guy is um, showing a little bit behind him. If these are quite dark, I would leave these a little lighter so there's a little transition from um, dark against light over here that we could actually see this flower. And that's not as important, okay. Now we're going to come back, let's go in and darken those interiors. So um, I'm going to come back with a little yellow ochre and a little burnt sienna. And again, I'm still using that, that pointy lettering brush. And I don't want a lot of water on the brush, so again, I keep tapping my sponge on the side of the pail to get rid of water. And I'm feeding into this puddle that I've, I'm building on. So we've got our cadmium yellow over there, a little yellow ochre. Now I'm, I'm mixing, I'm pre-mixing yellow ochre with some burnt sienna. And so the, my centers are still wet, I can see the glow. Um, and what I will do is, I also have my palette knife handy. I'm gonna be scratching out those little tips of the pistol and anthers. So I can come in and just create like a darker center here. And, and because that's wet, I'll get a nice loose, soft edge. And again, you see the, my first drop of paint was, was the darkest. And we'll pop a little over there. Okay, now I'm going, to, I'm going to bring in some cadmium orange and I mix that with a little cadmium yellow and a little touch of yellow ochre. So I'm coming in just below the edge of that, that ruffled cup, and I'm getting a little darker. So again, and, the, and my first passage of yellows is still wet, so the paint you're applying is mixing in with that yellow, so it's not as strong as my first entry, my first stroke that I came in. 
to give to change a little bit of value here. And again, each stroke is coming out away from the center. You'll notice I'm not I'm not coloring all with the same like horizontal movement here. My hands and my movement my, of my strokes are taking the contours of these petals and these little ridges on the petals. Let's come in on the underside of this. Okay, so remember I mentioned cerulean blue. So your cerulean blue is a beautiful uh, kind of turquoise green, and when it's mixed with its complement, I don't know if the charts are visible back there, um, your, so it's like a turquoise blue. It's opposite your hot oranges. So when I mix it in with these oranges, it's going to neutralize and become some kind of a gray. So we're just going to move some straight cerulean blue, and I'm really watering it down. I don't want it to be so strong. Better to go in a little daintier with less blue at first. And we're hoping this sits and mixes in with the shadows that I just put in. So the, again, that's the hot colors that we got into stronger yellow oranges on the undersides of these petals. Now we're coming back, and again, the synthetic brush, if I hold it against some white, um, you can even split the hairs. So as I come with the strokes, It's coming away and it's missing and it's creating like a, a new color here that's kind of looking like a greenish color. And I'm hoping by the time I move over here, as you move around, you're, you have less of the cerulean blue on your brush and it starts to pick up some of those hot colors. So we're getting um, a nice kind of shadow color. Come back with more cerulean blue just to do these leaves on this flower that's just bleeding out to our right over here. And let's bring a little bit in under there. <laughs> Alright, so now I've fed, I just fed some more cerulean blue and we're going to just feed it on the tips. I'm going to go back into those recessed centers of the Corona cups and I'm just giving tiny strokes to kind of darken. So we had burnt sienna in the center with some cat orange, and now I'm coming back with some cerulean blue, which kind of give it a little more neutral, natural color. And, and also it turns almost like an unusual olive green. Okay, so again, you can see those highlights, and I'm, I'm going to aim to probably go with a dark painted background at this point. Um, I may just come back with a dark touch of a dark brown. So if you don't have a dark brown, if you have a lemon palette, I have burnt sienna. You could add a blue, cobalt blue, to your burnt sienna to create a dark brown. Um, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to go in just with the tip of this round brush now with some cobalt blue and some burnt sienna. Too much water on the brush. And let's come in and just darken this center even a little more before I, I'm going to try scratching out some little highlighted Tips of the round during the pistol. Okay, so not, I have several palette knives. I, I only brought this one here. So again, I'm looking to see just how wet those centers are. You want to lift out when there's still a little bit of a shine, but it's not too wet. So let's just try lifting out some of these little light marks. And again, if the if the flower is like positioned a certain way. The pistols also may be positioned a certain way. That's not bad. All right, let's get into the, uh, the leaves and stems. All right, so if, I, if I'm going to be painting the background, I'm going to premix. I still have that wonderful yellow puddle that's still viable, so let's not waste that paint. So I'm going to add some green to it, or I could add some cerulean blue to it. I came in with the cadmium green pale. And let's see, it's going to give us a, a very pretty, maybe it's, I'm going to add a little bit of cerulean blue to that. But I'm looking to get more of a light valued 
green. And, and you can create different greens with different yellows or blues or different yellows and greens. Let's try some cabbage and yellow with some blue. So this is uh, that number 14, that's a number 12. So this brush, is a, it has nice natural hairs and um, I'm just varying, I'm dipping into different blues and yellows here to give me some different greens. This was a kind of like a turquoise green, look how pretty this is. And maybe we'll pop that in here or there. Let's go back to maybe lemon yellow. And this is lemon yellow with some Windsor green. Let's try and add some cobalt blue with some of this cadmium yellow. Okay. So now I neglected this little wrapper calyx over here, so I'm going to mix some cad yellow with some yellow ochre, and I just want to get a little bit of this just into that wrapper edge over there. All right, so if this was a larger painting, I could use like a two inch flat right now and pretty with my background here. I'm just gonna go put little, just some water. I'm gonna just work in this upper quadrant where I'm gonna start painting some dark colors into my background area. And I'm going to choose several colors that I've already used on the flower, and we'll kind of let them surge into each other and create an abstract, out of focus, dark value. So let's come in, let's say we come in with a little yellow ochre mixed with burnt sienna. So that's our warm. And now I'm going to come back, let's get into some darker blues. So I'm going into Prussian blue. Maybe we'll add a little bit of burnt sienna to that to warm it up. And let's, so I'm running against the dried edges of this flower here. So see how dark this is. And the minute we get this dark value as our negative space behind it, it's going to pop out your, your beautiful light value of daffodils here. And again, this, this paint is quite wet. I'm hoping my leaves, um, I, I might leave an unpainted red edge against my leaves here. Oh, let's change that blue to some straight cerulean blue now. So this is straight cerulean blue. We're gonna come in a little less water on my brush. So that's feeding into, that was yellow ochre mixed with burnt sienna. of burnt sienna with some Van Dyke brown so that your whole background doesn't have to be this solid green or a dark blue. So we can feed a little bit of that in over here too so that we have a little variation that goes from warm to cool. So I just want you to see how wonderful the contrast is and I'm getting, getting some nice play with uh, the surging of the wet into wet colors here. Maybe we'll pop some in a little up here. I'm going to rinse out the brush and I'll come back with some more cerulean blue. And we're going to feed that into the brown and it's going to get a nice neutral kind of a grayish color. And again, I'm going with the point, getting very tight and negative around my flower. So you can see how wonderful that that strong contrast from the dark background with some natural colors that we've used without the paint, with, without the painting, uh, is giving us in this wet into wet um, negative space. It's going to come back, not with a lot of water, but we're going to just put a thin coat of water down 
and we're just going to handle, we're going to work oh, a few inches at a time to just repeat the same process of creating a nice dark out of those same colors. So let's come back with that yellow ochre with a little touch of burnt sienna and we'll feed that in. Over here, I'm going to come back with that Prussian blue. And now, not a lot of water on my brush, and let's come down real close to the edge of our leaves and our flower shapes. That you hope are dry by this time. And if you work really fast and they're dry, you can always reach for a hair dryer. So you can see how this is proceeding. And again, I, I don't want it to be that this solid mass color. So these colors are just kind of undulating in and out of warm to cool. So let's come back with that um, cerulean blue and let's feed a little bit of that in over here. And I actually just went into this area that's dry with just straight cerulean blue here. I'm just trying to speed this up just to get a little more coverage down. Within our time frame, Come back with a little more burnt sienna. And luckily this is all dried by now. So I'm feeding into the negative spaces in between those thin sword-like leaves that are coming down. And again, I'm coming back with this point just to define the outer edges of our petals and our leaves, which are all a lighter value against the dark background. Prussian blue with a little less water so it's a little fuller strength here. And what I want to do is come with the dark brown and the Prussian blue. And um, as this is starting to dry, we can come back with some silhouette shapes of some dark leaves that are in between these lighter leaves. So I'm coming back and pressing down and lifting up and maybe crossing over. So now we have a variety of light and dark leaves in the background. But I, I waited for that to calm down. I, I don't want to do this when it's too wet because you won't have edges that are, are crisp enough. And I'm reloading that brush. So it's a dark brown with Prussian blue. It's almost a black. And we just have these kind of meandering through here. So you get the idea of how I've proceeded, wet into wet. So we worked dry through the flower area and the leaves and stems, and now we're working really wet into wet in that back. I probably should downsize to a smaller brush, but I'm lazy, so I'm just going to full steam ahead here. So again, a little more. Burnt sienna or dark brown with the burnt sienna, with the uh, Prussian blue. We're going to come back as this is starting to dry, and we're going to come back and feed up some of these darker leaf shapes. And I, I would feed those in between those down there. We have more open um, space up in here to have fun with that. Uh, but when you get to, to working very tightly, I would really downsize to number ten round brush to be working very tightly, painting those same colors in between the negative space in between the light valued leaves. How are we doing on time? Good. All right, so we'll get a little more done. I may not be able to finish this, but you get the idea of how to proceed. Um, let me work on these a little bit over here. So these are some more stems. And we'll go in with those dark colors again. 
And I'm, I'm actually taking note of some of these leaves that are down below and how you can bring them up and, and have them meet up with their uh, higher altitude. So again, I'm, they're going from thick to thin. So they're not all upright, they're not all static. They're leaning and, and almost bending and very rhythmical. But you're getting a very nice look and a nice depth of feel there. It's very painterly. Let me just squeeze them. Just dance this to them. So I did add a couple of these. So I had three diagonals there. There's two over here and two over here, which also help get away from the, the static sold, you know, toy soldier or picket fence look. Um, let me just come back and just do a little more detail on a flower so you know what to do with all the flowers. So um, I still have these strong puddles. I have a little cerulean blue and I mixed into the yellow ochre. And maybe I'll add a touch of cadmium orange, medium. So what I want to share is with a, a flat brush. This is a short, stiff-haired, this can actually be an acrylic or oil painting brush, but there are some stiffer-haired, uh, shorter bristles in watercolor brushes. You can go out and lift out some ridges. So let's go back into some of these petals. And I can come in and lift out a highlighted edge. So I dip it, it's just thirsty. I dip it into water, come back, I tap it in my towel. And you can come back and lift out some highlights on some of the petal surfaces. So now we're adding a little more detail uh, into your, your drawings that you're coming through, but we're pulling out some interesting undulating highlighted ripples within the petals. And just a few of these on each, on each uh, flower will just kind of help define maybe, maybe the edge of a little highlight on the opposite edge. If we can save an unpainted white highlight, then you can lift out a soft highlight. So this petal is overlapping the two on either side, so I'm lifting out a highlighted edge. And it's a nice soft edge. And this one definitely needs it where they're, they're all overlapping each other. So we have a highlighted edge here. I'm going to lift out the um, edge of this corona over here. And I'll just do a couple of uh, negative tight spaces um, in between down here. So let's say we do a base of some uh, burnt sienna with a little touch of yellow ochre. So this is this space is a little larger. So if you put down a first glaze, this is going to wet this area. And this is a number 10 synthetic round brush, which holds less water than the sables. So it's going to control your water. So I'm working in this tight area between these two leaves here. So that's a warm underglaze. Let's come in with that dark Prussian blue. And I'm going to get darker up here by the petal. I'm negatively leaving the unpainted tip of that leaf. And maybe we'll add a little bit of burnt sienna now to warm that up. So that's a greenish blue with some burnt sienna. Just come back with some cerulean blue. Again, you can go back and forth to the, the warm color, the cool color, until you get a neutral that you like, or even out some of your strokes. I almost got a beautiful, like a, a taupey color here in the corner. 
So you can see how we're progressing, and this is, the, this is very tedious because you're working in these tight, in tight little um, negative spots in between the leaf shapes. These are the open holes. The dark The gods are speaking to us here. a nice negative space. Look how it define this nice V shape over here in between the two petals. So I, I just want you to see how this is um, progressing and um, again we can come in with a little bit, I'm going to add a little puddle here of cerulean with a little cobalt and we can get a little more dramatic on top of these warm colors here by introducing a little bit of this. Again when this sits on, these are transparent watercolors so when they sit on top of these hot colors they should get neutralized. And I'm, I just got rid of the paint, just clean water. Now we're just going to stroke those soft uh, strokes downward to create like a cast shadow that's, that's under here, but it creates a little more drama. And these light flowers are picking up, reflecting the colors and the environment that you've created with the darker background. Okay, so I'm going to stop now and I hope you enjoy this. I hope you attempt some daffodils over the weekend or in the future while they're still in your garden. And it was great being with you again. I'll see you next time.